So I have a few questions with a minimum kit. What do you think is the minimum kit for your, your home? In reference to like cleaning or maintenance or? Yeah, just cleaning, cleaning and maintenance. Like right now, my other kit got kind of destroyed. So I've been just using this and just enough to to give a basic clean over shotgun, pistol, and AR. Right. I, you know, like, I still, like, I actually busted out my, uh, my original Hoppies gun cleaning kit that I got when I was, like, 12 years old when I got my first shotgun, um, just for the, the cleaning rod, the, the ramrod portion of it. You know, like, my experience, like, what I go into the field with is an Otis M4 kit. Mm -hmm at home like if i'm teaching a class it's usually i'll take that in a gerber just because it's got a breakdown rod and a pull you know uh, like boar snake type type mentality but or uh type of equipment it's i guess it depends on what you're running like if you're you know a, a decent lube cleaner and you know i don't think like you need the toothbrushes or whatever you need a good quality patch um and honestly, just the ability to sit down, take the time, and do it. I right. Think most people. Vor, vor snakes changed the game, man. Like before these came out. Before oh, here, I got my one for my AR here. Before these came out and were like a thing, you were sitting there, you were taking rods, you're twisting rods together that never wanted to fit right. Right. And you're trying to shove those down a barrel the chances are is, is dirty, it's got sand, dirt, whatever, whatever crap you've had in it. And you're just dragging all of that through your board. So you're, you're in a sense, while you're cleaning it, you're also, you were also damaging it to a certain degree. And now, I mean, this right here has completely changed most of everything. You know, the rods are still good, but that's for clearing malfunctions more than anything. Right. You know, and I can't, I can't think the last time, like, even on my long range guns, I don't even know if I run a, run a rod or even a bore snake down through them with quality ammo anymore. No. Maybe once a year if I'm going to store it out once the season gets done, you know, but like my carry guns, I don't, I might, <laughs> I might clean the tip of it because it's full of dirt or something like that, but, um, like copper solvent because I, I was reading somewhere some one of the long range groups that I'm in guys were like well I ran copper solvent did this and then ran lead solvent and then they put a bore snake down through it and we're like oh there's still deposits it's like it's modern machining when you put a magnifying glass on anything you're gonna see you know um, yep. your little patch. microscopics yep yes and it was like you're never gonna get rid of that if you look down and it's shiny you know, with your eyes, then it's, it's clean enough to work. Um, you know, we were talking about the Mausers earlier. It's the only reason I really don't get mine off the plate is because it's a bastard to clean afterwards, even though it's a simple soap and water, you know, warm water cleanup. Yep. Um, re-oiling, like you really have to re-oil those bores because they're not, you know, it's a hundred year old rifle barrel. Well, yeah, that was before chrome lining too, though. So you're, you, they're shooting corrosive ammo through it, and then on top of that, they weren't uh, they weren't solvent uh, using solvent properly. They weren't. They were just, you know, run a rag through it. Right well, uh, you know, for field field deployable, like you know, having a having powder that dissolves with water is honestly, you know, is the easiest way to run a you know run a supply chain. Um, but yeah, you know, modern ammo being so clean that, you know, other than like a shotgun, you know, which I might run a rag through once in a while. Um, my, my hunting shotguns are the only thing that actually get thoroughly clean every year. And that's because they're blued and wood stocked and, you know, versus the modern, a modern firearm. For, for the long range guns, the only time I clean them is if they've gotten wet, wet or wet or so, the muzzle has, has gone to the ground basically basically if the if the muzzle's gone to the ground for whatever reason or it gets wet and that's the only or it gets rained on that's the only time I, i'll send anything anything down the board and that comes from that comes from the army like we 
never see a guy you'll never see a a, a sniper throw a, throw a rod down his m24 unless it's just that situation it needs to be it's wet or it's got it's gotten in the dirt somehow right and and that's the only time you'll see it because just that it's it isn't it's when you've sent those rounds through the uh, through the barrel you're you're uh coating the inside of the barrel you're getting rid of the microscopics those are getting filled in with uh, the copper those are getting filled in with carbon and it, it gets to a certain point where it's it becomes actually flattened out and you won't have that uh the the little microscopic imperfections messing with the round as it goes down the barrel right so uh and the good thing about it is is it pushes any excess the, the the round itself will push any excess out so you're, you're never going to completely clog the barrel is what some people i'm, I'm guessing what some people think that they're going to have that, that it's going to happen right like the, the the guys that you'll see out at camp perry they'll be out there uh cleaning the barrel out after like three they'll fire three shots and then clean the barrel real quick and then fire three shots and clean the barrel like if they would just you know fire a couple of magazines through the rifle first and just fire off of that, those couple of magazines, they're going to, they're going to reach this, the same, uh, their, their, their dope is going to be more accurate at that point. Some of, some of that, like some of that voodoo amongst the long range shooters, you know, like I, it's one of the guys on our team is a, is a SWAT sniper. And, you know, he's like 15 years in the Marine Corps. He's like, I don't even clean my gun after I crawl through the sand with it. Yeah, you know, he's like, I wipe down the action with a brush or a rag, but it's like you said, unless I, unless he dirks the the bulk of the tip of the barrel in the mud, yep, there's just no reason to mess with it. But to get the back, only, the, and the only reason I do it for it, my my the only reason I'll do it for if it gets wet is if it's uh, it's it's held back from because I, when I was in the army, I was in Hawaii, so like, right, the things right. we're getting we're we're gonna have to get cleaned every day just because the humidity. And I figure the humidity, while it isn't as much as Hawaii here, it's still pretty. It's still up there pretty high. So I just kick it back to if it if it gets rained on, then I'll throw a rod down it, or not a rod, but I'll throw a boar snake through it. But even then, after that, I got to re-zero. I got to recoat the barrel. You, you, you know, that's that's the, the the thing behind it. To get back to that, like next question. Um, I mean, like personally, like if I was building like from, from scratch and this is probably like my preferences, would, it would be just even a basic kit, whatever it is, um, whatever you can afford, honestly, you know, obviously more, you know, more better is more better type of deal or whatever, but just like, even just a bare bones, basic kit, a boar snake that will fit your barrel. And I would run a like, so I run Hoppy's gun oil, but for very specific reasons. And then a like uh, entry level, base level, like us, um, you know, like the Break Free brand CLP, which is a just a, a super basic CLP product cleaning lube. Yeah. Um, and that, like, honestly, 90% of the world that, that would cover everything that they need yep. right there. Like, uh, I, I've told these guys about it as I, for the, the lubes, the lubes, everybody takes that lube thing to way too extremes. It's like, you can literally run motor oil and keep an action running. It, you know, it's just trying to do different things at different points. You know, it isn't going to, I mean, used motor oil isn't going to clean the action, but it'll lubricate it enough to keep it going. But yeah. Uh, I basically get it. I, I'll use whatever I can get a hold of for the most part. Uh, for actual solvents, I like uh, on the opposite of you. I like ballastol. Uh, but that, like uh, like I told these guys, though, that's for different properties for it. Though it's it's more than that's the prepper side too. Like oh, I can clean my hands and get rid of it's uh, not triple antibi uh, antibacterial or antibiotic, but it's a uh, it's like single or double, one of the two. It'll actually, uh, because it's it's natural oils, it'll actually uh, disinfect your hands. Right. So. Like, I'm a little weird because I run AK. 
but all I run is like hops number nine or uh, rem oil. I got a 30 cal boar snake and I've got the cleaning kit that comes with my AK, like built into the butt stock with the rod underneath the barrel. Yep. yep. Super and basic. That's, but it and that's the thing is like the, the more basic you can go, you know, like, I mean, prior to me being in the fire service and stuff like that, you know, my job, like army contractor, armored car, um, you know, and the LE stuff, it's, it, it's, I had to have whatever could like fit in a small backpack, you know, just cause it's, I'm space limited for everything I yep. did. Yep. Um, you know, and it's like, and that's that basic, like, like the break free, like this stuff. I mean, this, this bottle here is, if you can see it, you know, super clear, this bottle is probably 15 years old and it's yep. half full. Um, because you don't use too much of it, mm-hmm. but like the, the deeper down the rabbit hole you get, the more specific you, you start running, like, um, like my, my carry guns, like the guns that I carry 90% of the time on me, my duty gun when I'm, when I'm on duty or doing search and rescue stuff. And then my patrol rifle and my long gun, um, you know, that gets a specific, like I use fire, uh, fire clean on it because it has a specific temperature um it has a specific temperature coefficient in it where it doesn't it gets wet but it doesn't you know my body heat doesn't get it wet where the break free clp like if i put it on a carry gun once it dries and you know it goes away like you you know you follow the proper directions and i carry it on myself at the end of the day on especially on a good summer day I look down and my action will be wet. Every place that I lube that up will actually be wet with oil just from body heat or sunlight activation or like the fire clean has a higher heat threshold. Um, So it doesn't collect dust and dirt. And if you're in an environment like that, you know, those are, we're hops number nine. I use it on like blued guns that have still have blued finishes, like my shotguns and stuff like that. um, Because it's a thicker oil. It's like, it's kind of like you think motor, different viscosity motor oils or gear lube. They all have different purposes and properties in life. Um, but yeah, you can get like, some guys get really religious and weird about lubrication. I'm kind of like, yeah. like, whatever I can get, I have my kind of go-tos. Um, there's certain things that I'll avoid. Um, the REM, REM dry lube, which is just a, basically a straight up silicone spray. It, that's kind of one of those things. Like it doesn't do what people think it does. So you know, you, you, you're going to put it on a gun and you're going to come back and find it rusted because it's straight up just a slide and action, you know. Lubricant. Yeah, it's, it's just a lubricant. Yeah. Um, the, the good thing, the thing for that, though, is for, especially for around here is uh, sub-zero. Yeah. Not sub-zero, but uh, sub-freezing temperatures is when that actually gets into a, and when it's out, going to be out for longer than, I don't know, say, say you're hunting, you're on a hunting trip, a hunting camping trip. That's probably a good time to to throw the, the silicone lubricant in, right? Um, or I if you're in a dusty that. environment type of thing. If you if you if you can ever find a friend in the medical supply world, the lubricant, the micro lubricant, I then it goes by a ton of different names that they use to lubricate, um, like the medical, the micro medical devices and stuff like that. Okay. That stuff is amazing in extreme cold. Okay. No, no, why? Like, never figured out why. And the stuff that I had ran out, and my supplier disappeared a long time ago. <laughs> um, but like, I don't know if you guys have ever used it or not. Um, Gunzilla. It's actually a Michigan product. Um, it was tur. I there was used to be. A, I don't know if you're familiar with Michigan Police Equipment down there in Lansing. Yeah. 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 So used to be a guy, the guy that used to work behind the counter years ago, his name's Dave and his pictures behind the counter now, but Dave was never a cop. He was always a salesman and, but he knew his customers and he knew his audience. And when they brought that stuff in there, the salesman was like, Hey, you guys, you know, you ever use this, whatever. He's like, look, I have to, I have to know it works, you know? Cause we already sell this stuff, you know, MSP swap buys all their stuff through us. Every, almost every police department in Michigan yeah. buys their stuff through us. He's like, so I, we don't put anything on the counter that we, we can't stand behind and explain to them. And what they did was the salesman said, go find whatever clean gun, the cleanest gun you have in the shop and 
you know, they sprayed down a patch and ran the patch through it or whatever. And the patch came out filthy, like just that much. Yep. Um, I took some, actually that bottle's almost completely empty because I used it on that Mauser barrel because I thought the barrel was smoked from corrosion and it's a CLP, but it's a really like, it's a, it's a cleaning, it's a combo. Yep. You know, it's one of those, like I keep a little bottle in all my kits because if all else fails, it'll do everything I need it to till I get home, you know, lube it, clean it, but it will attract itself to metal. Like it's really crazy. Like if you, if you got like deposits or whatever on a gun that you're trying to get rid of, you just soak it, let it sit. And it will, it works its way to the, to the metal base and it wants to be next to almost like magnetic and it will separate everything else and just stuff will just come off and just chunks and pieces. It's crazy. Um, and it doesn't, cool. with, uh, you know, something that just kind of crossed my mind because I'm staring at a pistol, but you know, people need to be mindful that different solvents and lubricants with the, uh, the plastic revolution, um, some of them interact badly with your, with your firearms, you know, it's, you know, I always kind of raise my eyebrow when I read a lubricant container, it says, you know, does not, you know, works, works well on your Glock. Okay. <laughs> well, that means at some point in time it didn't, and you had to fix it because people were having, you know, issues with it. Um, you know, those are new shooter problems. I think, you know, that's the gun store. I went to Cabela's or I went to Gander Mountain and they sold me a pistol because they told me that was the pistol that I had to have. And this is the gun kit I needed to have. And they go home and they don't have a clue what they're doing with either one of them. Yeah. I, I got lucky. And that 17 was said, this is how you clean. <laughs> You're going to clean this way every time. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I, I, I was, I was sat down, but I, I grew up farming. So there were shotguns all over the place and it was just, you know, I, I learned the farmer method and then, you know, as I got older, your various jobs, it's was taught different ways and into the gunsmithing thing. You know, the, the first couple of times you refinish a firearm, you get a very, a lot bigger appreciation for proper lubrication and oil and storage of firearms. Um, after seeing people's screw ups, you know, if they don't oil it, you know, they bring it in and it's like, ah, it's all rusty. I just put it away six months ago. Uh, yeah. Okay. You know, yeah, you money, fix it, make yeah. it pretty again, but <laughs> you know, 30 cents, 50 cents of prevention would a, you know, will save you hundreds of dollars on the back end. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it, uh, what, what is it? Prep works 90%, 99% of the battle or something like that. Yeah, something like that. But uh, I have a couple of those guns that somebody didn't didn't really take care of them too well before I got them, so they they weren't oiled enough to keep rust off of them. So I got a shotgun that's has some rust spots, and also my twenty two. I mean, they both shoot fine, but aren't the prettiest. You know, and some of that is like that's. It's a, it's a, unfortunate we don't have, you know, we don't have the old school small gun shop gunsmiths around like we used to. Um, like my buddy's shop that I do some of my work through, it, he doesn't even do bluing. You know, it's not anything that he ever got into. It wasn't, you know, he was in the, the mechanical side, the tool making side of it, putting guns together, building long guns. And, you know, we do dirt coat and that kind of stuff. And, I happened to get lucky when I went through high school that that was part of our wood shop was actually refinishing firearms. Um, you know, and that just kind of like hit a niche and became my thing. Um, and it's a good little hobby. And I mean, it's a decent skill. And honestly, this morning I was just thinking the other day, I was like, well, you know, I should buy a couple bluing tanks and just set out, set out in the barn for, you know, the next time I get a bug up my butt to do a shotgun or do a rifle or something like that. It's just, nobody has the ability to do it anymore. Yeah, everybody's turning to from from the what I gathered out of the the school that I went to is because uh, I went to SDI, so basically everything I did was online, you know. <laughs> and uh, basically, I took some pictures, and they tried to check it from pictures, and there, I mean, there was no real like, you're gonna. This is how you, you, you know, this is how you you build, 
uh, apart from nothing. There, there wasn't any of that. Right. It was all, it was all dependent on. I mean, gunsmithing has turned into armoring. Yes. Yes. It, yeah. it, like, your old school gunsmiths, they could sit there and checker his stock. They could sit there and build that build a a part from scratch. The, a part that you needed from scratch. That's all turned into. Well, I'll just order it online. Right. I I'll, order, I'll order it online and. And some of that, like, some of that keeps the price point manageable. Yeah. Uh, I was talking, you know, it's, there's a, there was a group that I was, I, I follow and I participate with the group with, um, in order to answer questions. And one part of the group, it was like, you have to show credentials on to, you know, that justifies whatever you're doing. And I was talking with one of the, you know, management, you know, admins of the page. And I was like, I, you know, I'm sending him video footage, you know, videos of guns that I've done and starting yeah. and stuff like that. And, you know, detailing out what, like I had the ability to do and sending him pictures. And he's like, I just need a certificate. He's like, I don't even care if it says block armor inside of it. He's like, I just got to have something to, to show to the business end that says that, you know what you're talking about. I'm like, I don't have that. I learned, you know, I mean, I'm not a master gunsmith if you, you know, in, in that regards, but I can tear one apart. You know, if I need to make a spring, I under, I know how to make a spring for a shotgun kind of, you know, lock work. Um, and see, and that's, and that's the, the stuff we weren't learning. The, you know, I, I wasn't, that's not really what my focus is anyways. I focus more on the, you know, you know the, the armoring side of it. That's, that's where my major interest is, I guess, you know, it's, I'm not really interested in building the actual springs for it or, uh, you know, doing my own mill work or anything like that, you know, my own threading or anything like that. I, you know, I don't have the money for, what is it? I think a lathe's going for about six grand now, something like that. Yeah, yeah. My, if I ever win the lotto, it's going to look a lot different around my place. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, it's it's one of those. It's like, you know, I don't have the ability to thread barrels. I don't have the ability to, to do the old school gunsmithing stuff, you know. I right. They had to, they tried to make me check her stock and it looked like I sat there with a screwdriver and just pounded on the piece. Oh, it was horrible. Oh, <laughs> but luckily they sent me the stock to be able to do it and it just, it's, it's just not my forte. It's, but, uh, some of it's an art, like, you oh, know, yeah, it really boils down to it's, it's an art and, you know, just understanding like, it, like, how do you, you know, just touching a thread up just to time the threads right so all the screws line up and face the same direction. Yep. You know, it's, I mean, it's, you know, we can go down, that's a huge, huge giant rabbit hole to go down. Oh, and, yeah. It, it's just, it's the nature of it though. It's, guys aren't spending, you know, like two weeks, two weeks paycheck on a deer rifle anymore. You know, it's, it's. Oh, no, you can plastic, plastic stock. I mean, Ruger makes a, a really decent entry level bolt action rifle that you can use in the shotgun zone here in Michigan. Yep. 350 bucks. Yep. And, and that's, and that's where, that's what, that's the reality of it anymore. I think the manufacturer has pretty much killed off the gunsmith and as it is. Yeah, I mean it's. I mean, thank God for brown owls and like places like Apex Parts and you know Numerix and stuff like that. But you can still get those old parts mm -hmm. that you can at least start like, you know, I can't remember what I broke, but it was, uh, it, you know, I was able to get what an old like I was able to get a replacement factory screw, like a factory original screw, and then was actually able to go to like a local mom and pop hardware store. Um, I had to hunt around for one, but that had like just a random nuts and bolts section. I, I went through until I found one that was the same size and thread pitch and then cut it and modified it to, to make it fit like it was supposed to. Um, just so that way then I could, okay, put it, put it in my little, my little spiral bound notebook of like this gun, this, this bolt matches up with, you know, this generically available part at wherever. That's, that's. That's just the nature of it now. What is it? Uh, I was I was going somewhere. No, it ain't important. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I gave Mike. I gave Mike because they sent me two copies of it. That I sent Mike. Uh, what is it? Brown uh Bob Brown his Gunsmith and Kinks. Yeah, that one. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, there you go. That right there. 
Yeah, I've got like, I mean, my grandpa, he always subscribed to stuff and like any books that they would send. Like I've got a couple old, like um, old gunsmithing books that were actually like put together in like the forties and the fifties. Yep. And it was not like a how to, but it was literally just like every couple pages was a different firearm specific issue and how to address it that was common in the world at that time oh you wow know? that's 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 awesome actually like, yeah because they, they sent me all the what is it the 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 breakdown manuals for, yeah you, you know your common breakdown manuals that takes you for a complete disassembly yeah I, I have all those I, I think i've actually sent some to these guys too but uh because it was yeah, awesome. i've got a couple of those Very from cool. you yep and uh it's 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 crazy the the just the, the amount of the 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 just looking for the schematics anymore is, right. it is it's almost it's almost daunting to the point that it's well, like and like newer guns you know like if you get like because i'm looking at like i'd like to get a beretta or a benelli you know somewhere in the the tactical side pick up another shotgun um you know just looking at those compared to like the old autos. Mm -hmm. I have a Browning A5 that was made in the early 30s. I've got a Remington Model 48 that was made in like 1954. And those all use just heavy springs and brass, basically brass gaskets that set how it's going to recoil. Yeah. You know, and those are like people that still have them. They junk them because they don't work right. And it's like, well, they don't work right because you tore it apart and cleaned it. And you've only ever shot birdshot through it, but you didn't pay attention to the way the rings came off, you know, when they were stacked. So when you put it back together, you just put them on and now, well, now it won't eject the shells right, or now it's slamming back in my shoulder. You know, it's, you know, like even my grandpa who's been around guns for years or whatever, handed me one, one day that wasn't, I was like, and I stripped it and was like, line the rings up what I thought should be the position that they were. And, you know, lo and behold, like fingers crossed, it actually worked. Um, you know, but he's like, it worked for 25 years and I stripped it down and cleaned it and the damn thing wouldn't go back together. You know, <laughs> it, yep. it happens. Well, that was, that was the gunsmith's, that was the gunsmith's trade for the longest time. It was, oh, I, he, he, the guy brings in a, a, a box of parts and says, I don't know what happened. Fix it. <laughs> yeah, I, I woke up and it looked like this. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's like a mechanic. It's, you know, even like, you know, like working on a car anymore. It's, it's all computers. It's all, yep. it's a lot of smart, like you gotta be a lot smarter to do it, to diagnose stuff, but you can't just go like, Oh, it's that, that noise. If it's making that noise, it's this, yep. uh, you know, in the gun side of the world, it's those guns still exist, but not as many people shoot them. Yep. You know? So it's like, I was told when I, when I decided like, wanted to get into gunsmithing like as a job my buddy who owns the shop was like flat out like go find something better to do he's like you can work for me until the cows come home but you're never going to make any money you know he's like i mean he doesn't even do it as like he's retired so it's a hobby for him and he you know sells more guns than he works on but well it, it's not just that it was uh i looked into i was more uh trying to go to the I guess the outfitter side of it, you know, like doing a, an armor slash outfitter, right? Basically, instead of having, you know, here's my, here's the guns I'm selling. Well, here's our, here's a complete package firearm, you know, start to finish with, uh, you know, optics, light, you know, whatever it needed to be a complete, a complete firearm. Right. So the mall ninjas. Yeah, yeah. The, gun, the, the guns for the urban ninjas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, I got a couple of those students. So I, I, I was one of those where it was like, you know, I was going to go down that route. And uh, I, I, I started looking into the, the, the uh, uh, luckily I'm zoned for commercial, for uh, my, my property zoned for commercial. So I was like, okay, cool. Well, I'm, if I'm zoned for commercial, then I'll just go up to the thing, see what, or go up to the township, see what I have to have to do on that note and they told me they directed me to the county and county's like well you're gonna need you know and just because i i was well aware i was needing an ffl at that point and uh uh 
you know, the, the, the business license from the county, the business license from the state, the state inspections, the, uh, the, the county here has a county, county inspection uh, for a safety inspection. Then that's even before the, the business license are set. Once the business license are set, then I got to get the, uh, then I can get the ATF involved. Once ATF is involved, then I get my license to be able to do it. I was, I was like, look, I was doing numbers in my head. I'm like, this is like $15,000 before I can even right. make a dollar. Yeah. That's, was, that's, that's the, you know, the crappy part is it's just, yeah. it's, it's impossible. Like I, there was a guy that retired from our department the first year I was there. And like, so like him and I actually became pretty good friends. Cause like, he knew I, like I taught classes and, did the gunsmith thing, thing on the side and he's like so he was basically wanting to do the same thing he went and got his instructor certification and he's like yeah i want to do instruction and you know set up a little gun shop just sell guns not do not do any smithing or whatever but yep. he lives in midland county and it was like just in the township he lived in just it was one headache after another and you know then everything was all set ready to go and the next door neighbor got a bug up its butt and the township supervisor was like, well, we've already granted you like two variances. He's like, we just, we just can't set a precedence to, to grant a third variance. And, you know, I told him, I said, just turn around. I said, just knock it all off, go get your gunsmithing cert certification. So you can actually hang it on the wall and shove it in their face. I said, and then come back in a couple of years and just say, I have my FFL. I'm going to be doing gunsmithing here as a business because then it's one variance. And then the guns, because it's a gunsmithing shop, you can sell whatever the hell you want to. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that's the. I mean, that's the great thing about uh, about having a gunsmith shop. At that point, you're 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 opened up to selling. Right, you but know. it was. But he he did a big he did a big fu. That was actually yeah. that was actually the day my uh, AK decided to go full auto and. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> no, it's it's one of those that it's uh, it's it's ridiculous. It, it's just ridiculous the hoops you got to jump through to, to like i've told these guys multiple times it's like you, you could bring me the thing you could bring the thing into me and i could fix it probably in five minutes but if i charge you a dollar you know i, I i'm up for i'm at risk of two hundred fifty thousand dollars and uh 10 years in prison you know just but just if we for, donate money to your time it don't cost it ain't nothing uh, well, so there's a so if you don't have an FFL and you actually have like your actual gun gun repair facility, there is a like a very specific line item in the ATF rule that allow you to still do gun firearms repair um, and so on and so forth out of your house or whatever. But it has to do with like your zoning. If your zoning allows for home based business then you just run it as a home-based business and you don't jump through all the hoops because you're not really going to have a, a storefront per se. It's, you know, appointment only. And then a yeah, lot that, of that, that, that's part, that's part of the thing too, is that, you know, uh, with the FFL was running it from home. Well, I just, if, if I'm like, which I would be, I just gave ATF the, the ability to come in at any time and check my property. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Oh, you, the, we, best we, way, the, the best way to do it though is uh, if you ever end up going down that road and you're going to run it from home is if you have an outbuilding. Yeah, I, I, that's, it, that's, what, that's look, where I was initially doing it. Look, uh, go to the county or the whatever in the post office and actually get the address, get a half address added for, for the business. And then you keep your records and everything out there because then it's, it's one of those deals where, you know, like my buddy, he's, he's a very paranoid individual, but when it comes to the ATF, he's a very by the book. And he's like, if they want to come in the house, I don't come in the house, you know, but they're the firearms, the, the, I don't want to call them inspection side, like compliant side of the FFL side. Honestly, if your books are in order after the first couple of years of inspections, like when they come due, cause it's like, what is it, every three years they, they have to schedule a check of your books. Yeah. Um, it's actually like, they should, you know, they call ahead of time. They don't do these surprise visits. It's, it's really when like 
random things. Like if you all of a sudden start processing a lot of orders, a lot of guns for stuff, and they really don't even track that because it's, you know, I mean, the for, the the forms are electronic or you can do them electronic, but you know, if you have the forms printed, they don't know what you're selling they, unless they show up and go through the book. Yeah. I mean, my buddies had them show up. They've called a couple times and said, hey, I need to know who you sold this gun to. Okay, well, give me a day. I'll call you back. And I think the one we were up in the shop, we were doing some milling on a couple of rifles. And they're like, no, this is not something that gets the weight. Like, we need it. Like, Ricky Tick. So, you know, and, and the guy the guy was like, listen, the gun was used in a crime. Um, we recovered the gun. We just want to know who you sold it to. Like, basically, you know, the serial number popped back to you. And, and, and in that, in that situation, that's a, like, that's a, <laughs> all right, fine. At that point, I'm kind of involved in this investigation. You know what I mean? Like that's a. Right. Cause, cause like my buddy, like, he's like, you know, he got off the phone. He's like, I'll call you back. You know, let me go through the books real quick. And they, uh, cause they were actually, their system was able to narrow down when the NC IC check was actually called in and done. Yeah. And so they told like they gave him the date. So he's like, okay, I'm going through the books. He's like, my asshole puckered up. Like, <laughs> I wouldn't have yeah. he was he was worried that he sold, you know, he sold a gun to a you know to a bad guy. Yeah. But you know, he, yep, here's the approval number, called them back, and they're like, Okay, you know, the you know, it ended up being one of these deals where the gun was the gun had been sold and then stolen, you know, but it tracked yeah, it, it goes back to the first point. Um I, there was a batch of, oh, they're like Saginaw County gets a lot of gun shops broken into pretty regularly. And about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, one was broken into, had a bunch of guns stolen and one was used in a crime and it was recovered and it was a SIG. It was a law enforcement SIG. It was actually a department issued pistol <laughs> that Michigan police equipment had sold to the sheriff's office up there. Well, the sheriff's office had traded in, like, basically the deputy had retired, bought his gun from the department, and then took it to Bear Sporting Goods and traded it in for something else that, you know, he wanted separate or whatever. And then it got stolen from Bears, and it had been missing for a couple of years. But, you know, again, the ATF tracked it back to where was the first sale? Well, it was sold to the Saginaw County Sheriff's Office from Michigan Police Equipment you know, they tracked it from there, but just, yeah, it's, I don't envy those guys, but I also don't want them. Oh, open your door. We're coming in to take a peek and see what you got. Yeah. That's kind of, that's kind of where a, a part of me was like, eh, I don't know about that, man. <laughs> but I'm sure we're getting way off track for what. Oh yeah. We've been down, down the rabbit hole. <laughs> we're seeing light on this rabbit hole. <laughs> All right. So, so back to the, the cleaning and, and lubricants. How about Matt on on an AK? Do you do do you use oil or do you use um, use a grease for the people using grease? I I've always used oil. I've heard of people using grease. Um, I haven't tried it, so I don't know if I would trust it or not. Um, I'm not in Russia, so I don't have to use cosmoline. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've always just used like rem oil or ballistol or hops or whatever. Um, I've seen, I've seen people use use motor oil, alluding to the conversation we had earlier. I've seen that used too, but we're not going to go into that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Does it know we're recording this? I don't think she knows we're recording this video. Oh, oh shit! I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> yeah, uh, grease grease actually works pretty good. Uh, we use it in our in our two uh, forties and our two four nines in the army, and uh, because it's it's we weren't worried about cleaning as much as we were worried about the the reliability of the weapon because you just clean the grease out the same you you would clean it if it had carbon buildup, right. but um. No. But you just coat it, recoat re it with with axle grease. It's uh, it, we it's we were lucky that our uh, our five tons, uh, you actually had to refill axle grease all the time, so we had a pretty generous supply of it. And it's some of that is uh, 
like, like with with the army and stuff like that. I, some of that has to do with more of it's a supply of convenience or convenience yeah. of supply. Oh, well, well, it's it, the reason we went with it more is because of the yeah. If, if, if you think about how hot your your axle will actually get if there's any type of sand or grit or anything in it, how hot, hot uh, the, the buildup of that is. Right. It actually, I mean, it worked pretty good. Plus with sand and, and the environment that we were in, because I was in Iraq when we were doing this, it's because the the CLP couldn't keep up. Right. Right. The, that's the CLP a, burnt that's down a lot quicker than the axle grease. And then it would also, the axle grease would keep running with the sand in it. But that was a, a situational thing more than anything else right and they, it was a with, lube with of the, convenience with yep. the ak system you know it, it's people like to people like to talk about how you know you can do whatever you want to it and, and the reality is, is you can but because of the way the the operation system the operating system works on it that that big large piston it's a lot of mass and it's a big giant gas port so lubed or no lube it's gonna run um, but if you actually tear one apart and you look at look at where the bolt actually rides in there, it's really not. It's while well, it doesn't have gas rings and it's not as machined as fine as like a AR-15 or an M16 bolt in a carrier group. It's you, you're still like that's your biggest moving part right there. And you know, so like if you're gonna pack in the grease, you know, it, it's kind of a you have to know what you're doing with the environment, you know. Yep, it, that's, that's, what, that's what I was saying. It's, it's environmental more than anything. At that, when you with grease, it's, there's a reason you're using grease. Right, it's like, I don't know if you guys cut wood, if you guys mess with chainsaws or not. Uh, you know, guys that at work, the guys that I work with, we run chainsaws obviously for rescue purposes. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't, they think bar oil and gear lube are interchangeable. I'm like, it, they're not it's you can run gear lube as bar oil in a pinch but it's it's to serve different purposes you know it's doing different jobs and you want on a chainsaw chain you want stuff that's sticky but wet you know gear gear lube you want it sticky you know you, you want that like because the heat's going to lube it up it's uh, you know it's just it's one of those back and forth things and well you know, well that's the thing too we could only use the we could only use the axle grease uh in the summertime i mean it's 140 degrees out there you know what i mean it is a scent that the axle grease is essentially turned into clp at that point anyways right in the summertime in the winter time it would get below freezing and you weren't using axle grease because that uh they we had one guy try it with his uh 249 and got one round off bang yep. tried to try to uh, try to charge the action and he couldn't charge that for for all the strength that he got, and it wasn't until we got it inside of a of a house and it could warm up that he could actually charge the action again. Yeah. yeah. See, that's the thing is like you have to be careful with like um, uh, frog lube, mm -hmm. whatever that that paste because that stuff will it's a lithium based grease. Um, you know, I got like my first rifle, my first M4 type or AR type rifle was an NRA high power back before the ban ended. Yep. And, you know, of course, everybody's going overseas, coming back with different, ah, use this, use that. And one of my buddies came back and he's like, you know what, he's like, white lithium grease works the best. It's less, you know, it's very low mess. It's very easy, you know, maintenance. I'm like, okay, so I ran it. And I ran that on, on that and an AK. And the gun, it, it ran fine all summer long. I was super impressed. Season got over, put it in the safe, go to get it out in April to start warming up. It was orange. It was locked up tight. Oh. I had to break it down and get the pair, get a, get pliers out and, uh, you know, leverage the bolt out of the carrier out of the chamber because uh, that lithium had just it turned into concrete. It, you know, and that's like, so I started asking around of guys in the know and they're like, yeah, that stuff's like, if you're going to run it today and tomorrow while it's wet, but once it gets a chance to dry up, it just turns it. It's it's no longer a lubricant once it once the moisture's gone out of it. Yeah, you know. Well, that's, that's we we, we had white it. white lithium for a while, and we uh, we burnt through our supplies quickly. Like uh, we had it 
we had it when we first deployed, like the first two months we deployed. And then after that, the, we had burnt through the, the battalion supply at that point. And uh, we just weren't able to get it for the rest of the year. That's why we were moving to, to axle greases. And, you, you know, uh, for a while we were, we were dry. Uh, we weren't lubing like we would in Hawaii in, our, in Iraq. One, it didn't need to be. And two, we just didn't have the supply of CLP at the time. Because this is 2004 when I was when I was there, we you, you know that was the that was the year of uh, an E4 telling the sec asking the sec def the hard question of hey why don't we have the gear to do our jobs? Right. Yeah, yeah. I, we were we were sending care packages over to guys that you know that were that we knew that were like hey graphite powdered graphite left left right and center and you know I'm buying out the local auto zone for you know, the key lubricants, you know, keyway lubricants as, as much as I can get my hands on. Cause they gave, I, they gave us some, that stuff in the summertime too, but you know, they, I, gave, I, us I some, uh, they gave us a 50, uh, uh, M two fifty with a hundred rounds. And I was like, Oh, there you go. I was like, so five seconds of firefight here. <laughs> like, this is what we're expecting out of this because yeah, that's a, uh, yeah, and I mean that's that's how bad our supply was. I mean, we 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 broke. We got to the point where we were, we got it by hook or crook, you know, uh, what we needed. But so that's why we switched to axle grease for that. It's just it was a, it, it, it was a for necessity and for a purpose. It, it it worked better than what we were working with. Yeah, I mean, like survival scenario push come to shove. I, I honestly probably would mix a little bit of used motor oil with some uh, automatic transmission fluid and and run that as a as a lube. You're just gonna have to remember to you're gonna have to do it more often. We, we've we've done uh, what is it 10W30? We've we've used that before. Brake fluid. Yeah, really but well. but it doesn't clean. That's the that's the the issues behind it is it won't clean. Right. And being in the army, you had to have a clean rifle as well as a functional one. So like people would actually care if your rifle was orange <laughs> kind of like where i work people get mad when the axes are dirty i was like a dirty x or a shiny x they both break shit right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah but the, for some reason it's it's a big thing for you to have a for you can have a silver rifle but you can't have a yeah the fit the finish is completely wore off at this point in time and it doesn't yeah. shoot with the shit anymore and it rattles but yep. you know it's clean that's all that matters yeah. but for loops uh yeah, I, I, I'm not. I'm not picky on them for the most part. As long as it does the job, and I can kind of clean with it, it's it's good for me. Yeah, that's my that's my biggest thing. I'm not. I I picked up a jug of the Otis brand CLP here, right before Christmas, right after Christmas, um, and I've been using that a little bit. I've been pretty impressed with it. It's as long as it's a CLP product, I'll I I'll use it. I uh, I got these from school that I've just just now broken into. It's free stuff, you know. I'll use right. free stuff. Yeah, it makes it better. <laughs> I, I ran out of I, I ran out of CLP, so I was like, well, I'll, I guess I'll just start using this stuff then. Dude, even if it's it, garbage, it, if it's free, it works. Yeah, it, it works. That's the that's the thing about it. it, it it's stupid. Like, uh, what was it? One of the one of the lubrications that they that that people were using for the longest time swore by it was the, the best thing since the since CLP ever it uh they they tested it and it was nothing but vegetable oil yeah it's fire clean it was is that fire clean yep it's uh it's soybean oil yep. it, it, it was the just, thing is like the the like after that big like after the world exploded after people's heads started getting put back together after that like you mean I'm paying you know, twelve dollars an ounce for, you know, the shit that's my wife is like cooks with, and, yeah. you know. But you're, you know, and I always told people that were like, ah, you're just paying overpay. It's just vegetable oil. Like, why don't you smell it? It does not smell like vegetable oil. It, it's it's a vegetable oil base because the reality is, is like, now well, Mother Nature's probably been doing it better than we ever can, anyways. Um, but you but put that, some type of cleaner into it too. Well, but that's where it comes with that high heat tolerance because that's what the 
um, fire clean what the Army, the Army and the Marine Corps started issuing for uh, the 240s because of its, it handles, it's got a high heat like activation point and then it doesn't evaporate out like it's, you know, it's got a lot higher evaporation point. So the gun stays wetter longer um, between lubrications and then it dries up. Like as soon as the heat drops below, like it's like a hundred degrees, it goes right back to dry. You can't, you don't feel it anymore. Um, I haven't, I haven't never used it. I've only ever used CLP for CLP and like whatever axle or whatever type of lubricant I could get my hands on for machine guns. I have, but for the most part, I'll, I'll, I stick with CLP for. Yeah. Well, that's all like, like CLP. And, um, fire clean, fire clean is just, it's a CLP variant. Mm -hmm. I mean, it still has the, you know, you can use it as a cleaner, but it's, you know, it, it's all just, it's a track. It wants to be next to metal. It wants to separate everything else. And it just, it boils down to like, what are the heat activation levels? And that's, you know, for most guns to, you know, answer anybody that's going to listen out in Facebook land, you know, for, for carry purposes, since that's what most people are getting into the gun world anymore is CPLs are kind of their first step into it is you really want something that has a high heat threshold because you don't want to get oil on your shirt or your pants, yep. you know, especially in the summertime. Um, and you don't want it like if you've ever been in a dirty, dusty, environment a lot with a firearm um wet guns attract dirt like shit. well not just that it'll, it'll attract lint too yeah that's that's the thing that not everybody thinks about especially with concealed with the concealed carrying and yeah. even open carrying is lint I, I pull so much lint off of my firearm it's ridiculous so so this gun was not retired, you know, per se or whatever, but I carried this for like nine, 10 years straight on duty and off. And, you know, I would pull out once a year, a big giant mouse trap. But if you can see the dust, the light doesn't quite do, but there's still a giant caked mouse, mouse nest up in there. Yeah. Cause most people don't realize how much lint floats around from your shirts, your, yep. your car seats. Um, you know, and just environmental and it, stuff. Like, and it doesn't care if it's in a holster or not. No, yeah, no. no. And and they don't care it. if it's in a holster or not because I, I, I am constantly pulling, uh, pulling the lint off of the, off of my trigger. Yeah, I, uh, I carried a J frame as a backup for ages, and honestly, like it was in a sticky holster in my pocket, and at least once a week I would have to pull it out, blow the lint off the trigger just because it made myself feel better. Yep. Blow it out of the barrel because the pocket lint would just fill the barrel up and then the hammer channel would just be just full of whatever. And it's, and I would, that one's an old, like that gun's over 40 years old at this point and it's blued. So like every couple months I'd get it out and like that one, I would actually run the hoppies number nine oil on, let it soak wipe it down and then put some CLP on it just because the moisture from my pocket would just eat it alive. Yep. And that, and that, that's the, that's a part of the thing that comes into the, about the, uh, how you clean it. It, it. it depends on the weapon itself because yeah. like you just said, some things, uh, that you, that are like, for instance, glued or, or niter finished or anything like that. That's just basically like a real, real thin coat on top of things, almost in some place times like a paint. Right. And then, but you have stuff like uh, phosphating and then uh, parkerizing, and that will actually absorb the, like, that will absorb oil. So like the guys that are worried about like my finish on my gun, you know, like I'm not really worried about that. I mean, like, I'm not really worried about it, you know. <laughs> it, it, it's Krylon rattle or rattle can, but uh, uh, that if 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 it is uh, if it is phosphated, yeah, if it is phosphated or uh, parkerized, that oil will absorb into it, which is actually a good thing. It does protect the weapon at that point. 
What about Cerakoting? I Honestly, I've never had anything Cerakoted, man. I, it's expensive. I, it's, I have. It's I have expensive, a, um, but I can tell you that, like, so we do Duracoat at the gun shop here in Bancroft. The bunch of the guys went up to Wisconsin or Minnesota, wherever the Lauer shop is, and got certified in it. And Duracoat versus the Cerakoting, it, it's Cerakoting is, in my experience, isn't as wear resistant as like Duracoat is. I'll say more labor intensive. It's yeah, they're they're both kind of a pain in the butt to put on, um, and if they're not put on properly, then it's just it's just like a just anything else. It's like a bad autom. It's like taking a car to Mako. They don't do it right. You're going to know what was done at Mako. Yep. Uh, but I know when we first started doing Duracoat, we took, when we were talking earlier about that Mosin that we chopped up and turned into a bush gun, but we took the chunk of barrel that we had taken off, prepped it like we were supposed to, um, and taped off half of it so it was left unfinished and bare and just the normal bluing, you know, from the, you know, whatever Russian, Russia did to it. And then we Duracoated the other half. And we just chucked it up in the, once it sat up for, you know, 72 hours, whatever it took to bake, we just chucked it in a rock garden in front of the house and left it there for a couple of years. Kind of forgot about it. And we were, we were messing around and, you know, like, just like, hey, what, why is there a gun barrel sitting in the flower pot, <laughs> you know, type of deal. And, you know, we pulled it out and the bluing was just all rust of the shit. But like the Duracoat even where we had scuffed it up a little bit from just chucking it down the sidewalk to see how strong it was going to be. Um, it, it was still solid. You know, it, it's one of those definite hardcore. Oh, I, 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 I'm a believer in it. I actually had a, I, I have, I have some dirt coat down in the basement right now. I'll tell you honestly. Uh, I, it's one of their aerosol kits. So I'm not kind of like, it's one of those where I'm like, uh, I don't know how this is going to go, but it's a, their Durapart uh, product. I had a 1911 I was going to do. And, uh, do it. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's a little bit more expensive than you think it is. <laughs> but uh, I know how expensive it is, bro. Yeah, well, by the, time I'd, by the time I'd be done, I'd be at well over Kimber prices. Um. Don't do uh, it. It's not worth it. But um, the only gun company in the world that has the balls to charge you fifteen hundred dollars for a pistol and then tell you that it will only work with one type of ammo. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that takes that takes some major giant cojones in my book. <laughs> oh, I, I've I've told these guys like the, you'll see the guys and they're 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 prouder than hell. They they I got a Kimber. I got a Kimber. I got a Kimber. Like okay, buddy. Well, you got nothing but mem parts in that bitch too. <laughs> oh, my favorite one is, you know, these guys like, you know, I've got a Kimber or I've got a, you know, Wilson Combat or something like that. It's like, oh, you do? What do you carry? Ruger. It, you know, like, yeah. you know, they, they got they they pull out a wow. little LCP and I, you know, some some shitty little concealed gun, and I'm not knocking a little LCP. But you know, you drop eighteen hundred dollars in a pistol, and I'm like, "Well, no, it's a nice big gun to carry." But, you know, I yeah, because what uh, happens if they have to use it and then they get it taken by the cops? Yeah, but you, as long as it's a good shoot, you get it back. <laughs> uh, if it's a bad shoot, you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> my CPL instructor got a brand new Wilson. He was so excited. He's like, "I just saved up. I, it was twenty four hundred dollars is what it cost him." Yeah. Right. I just wow. spent twenty four hundred dollars on this Kimber. I just spent twenty or, uh, on this Wilson. I just I finally saved up. I said I need it. I'm gonna get it. I'm gonna get a Wilson. He fired three shots out of it. Three shots out of his brand new Wilson Combat. Click, 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 click. Had to go in for six months for warranty. Yeah, you know, Did I put a firing pin in it. It was. I, I don't remember what the problem was, but it, he, he fired three shots out of it. And uh, it's one of those things where, like the like the joke used to be, 
you know, I don't know if you ever messed around with any of the armors in, in the battalion armory or company level armory or whatever, but if anybody ever messed around with the 1911s, the, you know. Oh, the, no, no. Not, the, that, not by my time, no. They, the, they the, the, maintenance, were long gone. the maintenance train, you know, for when, when a 1911 is carried into the field and it doesn't matter who carries it, there, it needs at least three guys behind the guy just to make it work all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had them. They're good guns. Like, they're fun guns to shoot and they're fun guns to play with. But I like short of an STI, I wouldn't ever carry one for defensive purposes, no matter no. how much I'd shot it. Just like like the STIs have proven themselves, and uh, um, well, the Nighthawk Chambers. Nighthawk is really up there as far as like acceptable duty level. Like I kind of laugh. Like I don't know if any of you guys are on the primary and secondary world of uh gun stuff or whatever but you know what was it seven eight years ago when the Roland special type glocks were that that was just that was the shit that everybody had to have and yep. every every police yep. officer who was anybody yep i gotta have it this is what we're gonna run we're switching departments over and you know now the the new thing is the new hotness is the, these sti nine millimeters which i mean they're super accurate guns high round count Yep. You know, and they're built oh they're, they're, they're outstanding they're built firearms they're just like you know just like uh you just said a minute ago it was like what happened you know but when you use it you lose it and you know these guys are paying for these out of their own pocket and it's like you know department shoot or not it, i mean if it's a good shoot some departments still don't give guns back you know for for officers if it's a personal if it's a carried firearm of the department Evidence. It, it stays in because like now that like it was an on the job thing, well, we still have to retain it for liability purposes because you don't get the same lawsuit protections that like, you know, if you or I are walking down the sidewalk, shoot somebody in the state of Michigan, you know, because they cross one of the three magic boundary lines um, and it's ruled a good shoot when everything's all said and done, prosecutor says, yeah, we're not pressing charges. It's ruled justified or whatever. Um, you know, you go down to the sheriff's office or the state police office and sign out your gun out of the property room and away you go. If you're a cop and you do it on the job, you know, it's seven years is how long is a litig is the the statute of limitations for a lawsuit. Yep. So you know, and it's evidence at that point. It, it, either way, it's evidence. Right. And like, to I'm a certain cool. degree. Like I get to carry with, with our department, um, you know, we're not our reserve guys aren't issued guns. We just have caliber restrictions and uh, action types, you know, so it's, we carry our own stuff because that's the whole, like my back of my head, that's that same thing. We have guys there that like, Oh, I want to carry this. Okay, go for it. But you know, I mean, hope you don't ever plan on having to use it. Yeah. And I don't think anybody ever plans on having to use it, but you know, if I, again, I don't like the fact that, you know, I got a $400 Glock on my hip that I might have to surrender over to the property room for, you know, for purposes, you know, they're, uh, let alone a $2,500 STI. Yeah. Right. You know, with a optic and comp and, you know, all these other. Before, be, yeah. Before you know it, that, that 25, that 24, $2,500 gun is a, is a $3,500 dollar. $3, gun. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, not that. And that, that's even, if you if you got the actual the STI with the optic cut already, yeah. If not, you're looking you like four it. or five. If not, then you're paying for the then you're paying for the optic cut, right? After the yeah. fact. That's the thing is like I know like guys and you know people in circles like they still will like oh you know buy a Glock it's just as good and then you know drop another five hundred dollars on upgrading and it's like you know and guys that have that money can good for them, but the the average guy whether you're carrying for concealed purposes or law enforcement or whatever, you know, two or three upgrades to make your life easier on it. And you're still not out of gun. Worst case scenario, you never get it back because they just won't give it to you. You know, you're not out of life savings. <laughs> right. Dude, I bought an FN, FNS, because it's almost a Glock, but it's a lot more comfortable for me and it was the same price. And right. I didn't have to do all the upgrades that I'd have to do to a Glock. Right. Yeah, I've been eyeballing one lately just for giggles to go some go another direction, but I haven't figured out which way I want to go yet. I've been eyeing an I'm, M17 for a while. Uh, I got a yeah, that's, have fun. 
that's the the 17 through 20 somewhere down the that road is a, a possibility. 320. Yeah. Oh, I, I've been I've been eyeing it just because uh, I like I, I guess I carry a, a ninety two uh, ninety six A one right now, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was what I got. I got it basically as, as my first pistol, my first purchase pistol. It wasn't issued, and what did I do? I, I bought an issued pistol with a light rail because. I knew I was going to put a light on it, and then I, I thought I knew better. Or I thought I knew guns at that point, and I bought forty because when we were, when I was deploying, when I was still in, everybody's that was the hot round. That was the as good as a stopping power of a forty-five and a capacity of a nine millimeter, and it's yeah, you, you know, and. Whatever, it, it's it's a excellent firearm, you know. But um, part of my thing is my firearms have to be dual purpose. They have to be able to. I have to be able to use them in a civilian aspect and a martial aspect as well. So I don't like pistols without some type of manual safety because you know I, the, the the job that I used to have, the more martial side of it was you drop a firearm without a safety on it, that thing is going off. <laughs> and it's probably going off towards somebody that you don't want it to go off towards, either yourself or one of your friends. So it's, it's, it's one of those that uh, I'm a manual safety guy. I, I've trained through it. I've, I'm not worried about the no levers and switches. You, you, you know, it's, it's same action that I do to, to disengage a rifle is the same action that I do to disengage a or but your fine motor rifle. skills. What's that? But yeah. your fine motor skills. Fine motor skills. I was, I was, uh, <laughs> go out round and round to the Department of Defense contractors because like we had to carry our ninety twos. Yep. Um, or M nines actually is what we were issued and <laughs> just like Safeties, you know, say, you know, my, like, I, I managed two different facilities and sites and, you know, like, oh, you got to make sure your guards have safeties on. No, no, they're not going to have the safeties on because well, it, 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 it's yeah. more, it's more of those. It's that one, I have a serious distrust of a, of a firearm with a safety on the trigger. It's just one of those. I'm not, it's not my, it's not my thing you know what i mean it's, it's out, it, it, I, i'm more than safe with a firearm you know what i mean it's just not my my idea of yeah that's the, probably not the best place to put a safety there homie <laughs> like it's not uh, and I'm, i'll never discredit anybody for doing it it's just not my thing you know i've i've managed my draw stroke mm -hmm. and my thumb when it comes down to to level out on the firearm comes out enough to sweep the safety up it's what you know what i've been trained to do and uh well, and that's a and that's a lot of it is like you know like i like the nine the m9 and the 92 series yeah they're, they're they're great shooting guns um excellent you know, it was like i i got lucky enough to talk with a couple guys that were lapd in the early 90s when they first switched over to them and uh when they were when they were running on me you know that was beretta even told them flat out i was like it, it's a it was never meant to be a safety. You know, it was always meant to be a manual detocker with yep. a safety bar, you know, but they were always like, even Bretta, like, you know, the Italians and everybody, you know, they always ran them with the safety disengaged for that simple fact of like, it was remove the, the that super long first trigger pull was all the safety that was pro. Oh yeah. It's the, it's the army. It's, it's our military, especially that, programs that nope nope nobody is smart enough to use one of these so yeah. we're going to keep them unloaded you know magazine separate nothing in the chamber oh, you know see, it would always cracked me up because they would... oh i i, I carry uh, what is it condition two is i i don't know or, i don't yeah, know the conditions very know. well I mean, but uh it, I, I carry it locked and, or locked and loaded it's just got a safety on but like i said i've over years of pulling it, drawing it, it's always 
pull, draw, disengage. Pull, draw, right. disengage. And that's and pull, that's draw, draw that's, disengage. That's, hit the switch for the light. That's cortex. That's you know. That's that. It's you know because there's no such thing as muscle memory or whatever. Yeah. Um, you, you know, but that's the the synapse. That's your program. Yep. Uh, you know, and I was the exact opposite. I learned on Glocks. Like I was, I was brought up, cut my teeth in Glock pistols. Yep. So it was any like the minute you handed me a gun with a manual safety on it. Not that I couldn't do it, but like I mean, when they handed me that, it, it, first it, it, it day, first day was the range in a thousand rounds just to make sure that I was, you know, like get that grip on there and feel it and go, this is not my Glock. So like instantly, my thumb needed to go here versus where it would normally go on any other sidearm that I had. Um, and 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 that's and that's kind of where it is because even even drawing striker fires now I'll, I'll draw striker fire and I still sweep with that thumb because that's right. It's, not a, bad habit. it's yeah. a good habit. It's not a bad habit at all. But it's one of those like when I would get contracts for teaching like security companies, you know, which are the the biggest redneck hodgepodge of guns you'll ever see in one one existence because you know the company hires a bunch of guys or hires people and they go okay you got to have a gun and they show up you know I've, I've seen guys show up with six inch barrel anacondas because that's that's it and yeah that's what they know, got that's what i got you know other guys with uh you know one guy was a uh, i can't remember what the taurus revolver model was but it's the 357 with the it's uh has an eight cylinder chamber and it had like a six and a half inch barrel. I'm like, what the hell are you gonna do with that? He's like, I don't trust semi autos and yeah. this gives me eight shots. And like, it only gives you eight shots, but it takes you two seconds to clear clear your holster because the barrel's so long. Like this is okay. You know, and then I got guys with you know Ruger P ninety fives and just you know. Again, I'm not bashing those types of guns because they they almost always worked. Yeah, and, and that's and that's where I, that's where I'm at on it. I, I have no issues with the actual like like you want to carry a Glock, good on good for you, buddy. The fact that you're carrying whatever is just that. Like I said, my my part of my thing is it's it's is the the average citizen, the, the average civilian style, and then also the the duty or the the more martial style of carry for me and it's just it's what i expect my firearms to do is all right all right mike i'm pretty sure we're back on the rabbit hole again so we're off on another <laughs> rabbit hole but uh yeah i didn't really have much more written down as far as questions went besides um how often how often do you clean each type of firearm like Say it's a carbine. Do you clean that after you shoot it, or how hard do you break it apart? Me personally, Who wants to start. There we go. Me personally, uh, my carbines. I'm really, really, really bad at cleaning them frequently. Um, it's kind of more like when I'm out at the range and I start to notice a little bit of weirdness that I'll break them down fully and clean them. Uh, but again, AR guy, so I don't have to be as religious as with the, uh, or AK guy, so I don't have to be as religious as the AR guys. My carry pistol, it's usually once a week, just pull the slide off, pull the barrel, wipe it down, give it a little bit of love, throw it back together, stick it in the holster. Yeah. And yeah, my carry pistol, I like using the silicone wipes, like the, the, almost like a cloth with the silicone embedded in it just to wipe it down after I get home to get some of the sweat off of it. Um, that way I'm not putting a bunch of oil on it that gets rubbed off on my clothing again, but that's just me. And then I, I just make sure to check it and make sure that there's no lint. I'll clean it after, after every time I go shoot it a day or so after I shoot it, I'll take it apart and clean it. But what are you guys' procedures for that? For my pistol, my pistol, it basically uh, uh, maybe once a week, twice, twice a month, at the at the bare minimum. But my rifle is basically anytime the rifle comes out, 
and goes outside basically. I mean, obviously if I'm just doing like uh, mag drills or anything like that, I'm not going to clean it because I'm not running anything through it. It's not, it's sitting in the house in the same environment. But uh, if I goes out, then I'll, I'll break it down the, uh, break it down, pull the, pull the uh, charger handle and bolt out, wipe it down, maybe add a little bit of lube to it and other, and then just throw it in there. But my, my rifles, I, I'm not, I'm not worried about the, if I was more, uh, if I didn't have the Krylon thing, I'd wipe down the outsides of it. But I don't have to worry so much about the the outside of the rifle just because I I got paint on it. So it's it's it got its own little protectant there. So I uh, I I operate under the theory that like a dirty gun is a happy gun. Um you know my carry gun my duty guns and my my daily carry guns probably one good cleaning a year uh, my my conceal my my primary concealed carry pistol i might quarterly knock the slide off blow it, hit it with the air gun a little bit wipe it down with just a quick patch with a little bit of light oil on it just to make sure but um I really don't clean them too much. Again, it's like, it's more in my case, it's if I end up crawling through the dirt or having to go through a creek or something like that where I'm really exposing gunk to them. Um, my patrol rifle, other than wiping it down, I, it hasn't been cleaned in over a year. Um, I'm kind of like, like if I crawl, when I crawl with it, I might give it a little bit more love. Um, usually, you know, pop the bolt apart real quick, just a more of a, parts inspection at that point in time yeah. than it is a cleaning um you know and I, i'll wipe it give it a little quick wipe give it some lube and you know i i have a bolt i have a bolt carrier group sitting in a gun right now that when i first did it when i first got it i i decided i wasn't going to clean it i'm just going to run lube on it until it died and hmm. i was at <clears throat> i was probably at like three thousand rounds of really just mix of everything from wolf the shittiest lacquer coated wolf ammo that you could get your hands on to, you know, good M855 stuff. And I got it out to, we were, I was showing a guy cause I was using it for coyote season and went to pull the bolt back and it wouldn't move. I had to mortar it out. I was like, okay. And it was caked, you know, and I soaked it in some CLP overnight and it was right back to running like a top. I mean, it's actually that bolt carrier group now is in my, well, is in my, five, five, six SBR, you know, still running strong 17 years later. So it's, I don't get too bent out of shape about cleaning. Um, I, I did, I have had a Glock, you know, most people be really shocked at this. I have had a Glock actually really F up from over cleaning it. Um, and it wasn't that I over cleaned it. I just over lubed it and somehow ended up with a piece of debris inside the firing pin channel. Still not sure to this day how it got there, but it did, and it prevented. The gun would pass every inspection, trigger would go off, firing pin would come out, except the firing pin just wouldn't come out. Like it literally was, you know, we're talking microns of difference in actually between setting a primer off and not, because it would dent the primer, but not hit it. And, you know, when I stripped it down, tore it apart, it literally was just this little little piece of whatever came out of that channel. So I've been a little bit, I've been paranoid about that ever since with that particular gun, not any of my other Glocks, which I know is, <laughs> this sounds like the most retarded thing in the world. But every time I pick that up, it's just like, I have this little mental hang up real quick of like, okay, what's my plan if it doesn't work, it, you know, switching to my backup. But basically what I ended up, what I looked at, what I figured out, what I found out I did was it just, it got over lubed. It was, over cleaned if you will um you know cleaning too much too much lubrication just allowed shit to slide in where it shouldn't be so i mean if it's raining like if i'm out in the mud uh, you know yeah I'll, I'll wipe it down it's you know my hunting shotguns different story every night when i come in from the woods those get a quick little wipe down um just because they'll rust up because it's bluing i think it really for some for the home gamers trying to figure out what their, you know, for what their method needs to be or what they should kind of look at doing is really 
really understand how your gun's made and the material that it's made with and the finish that it has. If it's a modern gun and it's got a modern finish on it, it probably isn't going to need a lot more than just even a paper towel, you know, wipe down once in a while. It's going to be good to go for a long time. You know, if it's if you're carrying grandpa's 1911 that he carried into World War II, you're going to want to oil that thing weekly, but, yeah. you know. Um, but yeah, that's, I'm pretty loose. I, I, I don't have a set standard. I, my long gun, my precision long rifle is the only thing that has a religious regiment to it. And that's because it's got a big giant data book that goes with it. So, you know, that's, I pay very strict attention to what happens to that when it happens, but right. I don't have round counts on anything else. Yeah. I know my, my grandpa always, always stressed that whenever you took your gun out to shoot it, you'd clean it that night and then wait until the, the next day and clean it again because of the the moisture basically coming out of the barrel after it cooled down but I think that was more in his experience with the blued um, yeah those old, old uh, guns like that I mean it was you know we my grandpa's I'll maybe inherit it someday or maybe my uncle will but you know we have my great grandpa's Winchester 94 that was made in 1917 you know it's all original including the scope and it still shoots and it's shoots immaculate but that thing like that that gets that thing looks wet before it leaves the house and it gets cleaned and it looks wet before it goes back in the safe you know with a good coating of oil because that's just the way those were always designed to be so right i'd also say that i'd I'd also add though that the function check like you 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 talked about it is actually First thing, part of cleaning it isn't just cleaning it. It's also inspecting it. So right. you're, you're looking for chips. You're looking for cracks. You're looking for just about anything that looks detrimental to the weapon. You, rub in some places. Some pistol barrels will rub on one side or another, and that can tell you that something's not working perfectly. It's like a warning sign for it. Uh, you, know, you know, you start seeing peening on your, your hammer and your AR. It, 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 it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. Right. right. You, you know, it's, it's, it's little things that, you look, that you're looking for also. So that's, that's part of the reason, like, why when I take it out, I'll, I'll, I'll break it down. I'll basically look at the parts, give it a good little wipe down, throw some oil on it, and be done with it. Yep. Uh, the, best, the best comparison I can give it to is like if people understand the difference between changing the oil on a car and changing transmission fluid or, or dropping a pan is, you know, when you change the oil, you're, you know, you're looking at the oil, it's, it's going to be black. Usually you stick your head in the filter and take a peek at the filter, but you're not really going to see a lot. Um, you can put a magnet in there and see if anything sticks to it. That'll, that'll give you some more because you're looking for preventative problems or just wear problems really when you're cleaning everything but a transmission pan if you drop it it has a magnet in it to catch stuff and if you drop it and that magnet is coated with metal shavings um it, you know that tells you that you have problems so yeah you you really most of the cleaning yeah you hit it right on the head most most cleaning isn't about actually cleaning the gun as it is doing um just annual wear checks yep. and it depends on what you shoot you know if you're a concealed carry that you shoot once a year and the gun never leaves the holster other than that probably once a year is perfect you know other than like cleaning it once a month pulling the dust off of it you don't need to be that particular but no 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 absolutely I, not i usually like but you know whether i clean it or not once a year i'll break everything down that i use regularly and just inspect it um i think that's instead of counting rounds and you know every however many bullets you shoot should you do this or that you know like you said with the ak you know if you start noticing it's running a little sluggish all right it's probably time to clean it yep that's kind of how i run everything uh, myself but you know one, one good time of year break it down and look at everything make sure it all looks like the pictures in the magazines and put it back together and run it that's, yeah that, that's kind of it's to a certain degree that's how i am with my rifles um, 
like if I if, if I if I do something where I'm shooting like two three hundred rounds through it, then I'll I'll for sure give it a, a nice good clean, a nice in, in, inspection basically. But that's also because the next time I might not throw oil on it if I you know what I mean. I might not have time to throw a good saturation of oil through it, and I might have to to wet douche it. Right. Or, it, you oh, know, yeah. Or yeah, in like, the middle of the firing cycle and give it a good squirt. If I'm at a comp or something like that, then it's like when I'm done with that, then I'll give it a quick breakdown on a wipe down just because like Lord only knows what it what it got it's touched. You know, but I've seen sand lock up an AR fifteen. Three three greens of sand in the chamber of an AR fifteen locks those lugs up tighter than shit. Yep, yep. You no. Know, um which causes people to go into these long aggressive expletive tire <laughs> rants yeah, yeah. on the firing line because you know like you look at it and you run through procedures and it's not working it's not working it's you know it's but there's nothing you can do about it it just that crap happens and the only the either lube the shit out of it you know which just carry a cheap bottle of shitty oil and just flush it or you have to break it down and clean it on the spot but that's hey, all. Hey, hey Mike, I, I got to go help the kids yeah. out real quick. All right. Yeah, I got to get going too. To yeah, we'll call it good for today. But I like this, though. I like being able to talk over a bunch of stuff. Maybe we'll have to come up with another topic and, and do it again in a, whenever we get a chance. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm down game. for that idea. I think, you know, the thing is, like, even within the Facebook group, I know managing pages on Facebook is a pain. Um, it, you know, people have to, members of the group page have to interact with the page for that to constantly show up in their newsfeed. Um, there is a way for them to set, like, their notifications so that way they always get notifications when posting, like, that always shows up on their newsfeed. Um, right. But they have to do that stuff manually. You know, and again, it's, it's start small, start simple. You know, this is one of those things like, you know, people watch it, they learn something, hopefully. Right. And, and we get attention either way. <laughs> so, but yeah, this was definitely fun. And uh, we'll have to do this again sometime. Have a good night, guys. Have a good one, y'all.